There has never been a famine in a democracy. We live in a world with widespread hunger and undernourishment and frequent famines. It is often assumed, if only implicitly, that we can do little to remedy these desperate situations. This is a quote from Amartya Sen in the opening lines of chapter 7 of his book, Development as Freedom. Sen pretty much hits the nail right on the head here. And yet, not a single famine in the history of mankind has ever occurred in a democracy. Famines have killed people in seemingly every type of society, from feudal societies to societies with wide-reaching markets to state capitalist societies. Developing nations are frequently hit horribly, but also developed nations are sometimes threatened. But no democracy has ever had a famine. I'm going to make the bold but true claim that every famine that has ever happened has been man-made. And not man-made in the sense of it being the result of something humans have done indirectly, like mismanagement or ignorance or climate change or anything like that. Famines belong in the same category as war and genocide and enslavement, things which humans do to each other on purpose, and which are not accidents. In short, my argument is that famines are deliberate. Now there isn't some cabal controlling who lives and who dies through the food distribution. By deliberate, I mean that the leaders of particular states choose to have a famine instead of preventing one. Mr. Biden, quick word for the BBC. The BBC, I'm Irish. Man and Superman is a 1903 play by George Bernard Shaw, who insisted on being referred to as just Bernard Shaw, but he's an asshole, so I'll call him whatever I damn well please. The characters for this little excerpt are Mr. Malone, an Irish-American businessman, and Violet, his daughter-in-law. Mr. Malone begins, My father died of starvation in Ireland in the Black 47. Maybe you've heard of it. Violet responds, The famine? Mr. Malone replies, No, the starvation. When a country is full of food and exporting it, there can be no famine. The true punch of Mr. Malone's lines are a bit harder to get nowadays, but he is summarizing what a lot of people felt about the Great Famine in Ireland. Starvation used to have this connotation of something which was done to you, not something that just happened. This is made a bit clearer as Mr. Malone continues. My father was starved dead, and I was starved out to America in my mother's arms. English rule drove me and mine out of Ireland. He then continues about how he and the rest of the Irish are plotting to, like, go back and buy England and then kick all of the English nobility out. That's fucking based as hell, Mr. Malone. Nice! Mr. Malone is commenting on the idea that a famine is something that humans have no control over. Because it was a conscious decision of the English nobility that caused the events in Ireland, it couldn't have possibly been a famine. They were the ones in control. To Mr. Malone, famines are the result of nature, or accident even. He further claims that Ireland was full of food and even exporting it. So there wasn't a famine, there was a starvation. The English nobles starved the Irish. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, unfortunately unfolded the portal of happiness, whatever the fuck. The characteristics which characterize the character of what Mr. Malone describes are hallmarks of famine. Many regions affected by famine will continue to have food being exported. Many, many more have food surpluses, and definitely enough to feed everyone. Let's examine the Great Famine in Ireland a bit more close-like to see how well Mr. Malone's description described it. Regarding the abundance of food in the land of saints and scholars, Mr. Malone is mistaken. Ireland did face a decline in food production during the years of the famine. It wasn't really filled with food as he describes it. But when one considers the British Isles as a whole, there wasn't anything close to a food shortage. Remember, Ireland was nowhere near independent. The island could be considered closer to a colony than anything, but it was 100% a part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. This might make you suspect that Mr. Malone's second claim is false as well. More food here, less food here, must mean that food would be flowing in this direction. <laughs> With this one, Mr. Malone is right on the money. In the middle of what is perhaps the worst famine in European history, in terms of the proportion of the population that was affected, food was being exported to jolly old England. This seems fucking insane. Why would food go from a place without enough to a place with plenty? Well, it's a bit of a long story, but luckily, this is a YouTube video. 
So the world has changed a lot since the olden days. Production and distribution of everything, food included, it may surprise you to learn, used to be something organized by towns and communities and households, quite centrally actually. Now everything which is produced and distributed is sold in the market. In fact, this idea is so integral to our modern understanding of what the economy even is, that our current measure of the economy's size, gross domestic product, counts only production which has been sold. Housework done by stay-at-home parent is not counted towards gross domestic product, despite it being part of everything that is produced domestically. But if that same housework is done by a hired maid, then it is counted. Odd. So as you go back in time, when much less stuff was produced to be sold or traded in the market, your measures of GDP begin to capture much, much less of all of the stuff that we would probably consider part of the economy. Distribution in the market isn't done by need, it's done by money. Money. This includes distributing food. Food has to be bought in our current society. Sen, the author who I quoted at the beginning of the video, comments on this. What is crucial in analyzing hunger is the substantive freedom of the individual and the family to establish ownership over an adequate amount of food, which can be done either by growing the food oneself or by buying it in the market. Sen mentions people who grow their own food, but it's important to realize how small a group of people this is. Establishing ownership over an adequate amount of food, as Sen puts it, is done by buying it in our modern society. Farmers, who do indeed grow food, often don't even own the food that they grow, and historically this was true as well. The food would be owned by whoever owned the land, i.e. the lord, and not whoever did all the work of planting it and growing it and harvesting it, i.e. the farmer. This was the case in feudal Europe, where the state claimed ownership over all of the output produced using the land. And it's also the case in every modern business, where the shareholders claim the output that all the workers produce at the business. On top of this, many farmers also can't eat what they grow, because they lack the tools to make it edible. Raw wheat does you little good unless you can thrash it and process it into flour and then bake it into bread. Farmers don't grow the food that they eat. They grow large amounts of food to sell to buy the food that they eat. American farmers, for example, grow large amounts of a single crop usually, then they sell it on the open market, and then use the money to buy the food that they will eat. There are actually many government programs in the United States which guarantee the incomes of farmers if they can't get enough money off of selling what they grow for this exact reason. They sell food to buy food. A similar strategy is employed by fishermen and cattle herders in Africa. Fish and beef are high value calories in Africa, and they take a lot of labor time, man hours, resources, all that stuff, and especially cattle do. These herders often don't produce enough calories to subsist on, but the value of the calories that they produce is high enough that when they sell them, they can afford enough food to live on. The ratio of the price of beef to the price of an adequate amount of food is high enough to support their lives. In fact, it's not just farmers that obtain food this way. In our modern society, all workers do. You, for example, use commodities that you have yourself, namely your labor and your time and your skills, and you sell them for money, what we would call a wage or a salary. You then use that money to buy the commodities that you need, in this case food, but it could also be housing or water or medicine, whatever. It's a commodity to money to commodity process. You may see this referred to as a CMC exchange, so now we can understand why food was leaving Ireland and making its way to England. Food, like all goods in our modern economy, is distributed by the market, and the market distributes based on money, on the ability to buy the commodity. Food follows money, and the English were wealthy enough, compared to the Irish, to purchase food. So the market allocated accordingly. Markets follow money, not need. The Great Famine in Ireland, and indeed all famines, are not caused by a decrease in the supply of food. This might be the case if food were, say, distributed based on need and that everyone in a country suffered from the shortage, but that's not how it works in reality. Famines happen when the ratio between the price a worker can sell their labor for and the price of the amount of food that they need to survive collapses, either because the amount of money that they can get from selling their labor, or even their ability to sell their labor, goes down, or the price of food goes up, or both. Remember, the British Isles didn't have anything close to a shortage of food during what is probably the worst famine in European history. In this sense, it can be reasonably claimed that the Irish did not die simply from a lack of food, but because they largely lacked the funds to purchase food which was present in abundance in the kingdom as a whole, but which was not sufficiently available to them. Terry Eagleton 
The Great Famine in Ireland, which I refuse to call the Irish Potato Famine for the reasons outlined over the past few minutes, is not unique as far as famines go. There were countless famines where countries and regions struck by them had no drop in food production, or even increases in food production. There have also been many regions where the reverse is true. There have been massive drops in food output per person, but there wasn't anything ever close to a famine. This price explanation is what a famine really is, and it's not some special case. Famines are when people are denied food. The famine in Ireland could easily have been avoided with a subsidy or an employment program, for example. The English nobility, many of which owned the land in Ireland, that is, owned Ireland, chose to do nothing about it. If you've learned about the Great Famine in Ireland, for example, you've probably learned or at least heard the line of thinking that it was all the result of an overdependence on potatoes. This, as we now know, is not the reason that Ireland lost so many people to starvation. This argument can actually be traced back to a common talking point among the English nobility, who at the time of the famine ran both the United Kingdom's government and the land themselves through a system called absentee landlording. The head of the British Treasury during the famine was a man named Charles Edward Tevillian. The Treasury, and thus the head of the Treasury, are the ones in control of the government's spending. Charles knew very well of the famine, but made arguments which sound like something you could find in a modern history textbook. He blamed the Irish for their reliance on a single crop. And then he gets into some other stuff. Common stereotypes of the Irish at the time were that they were stupid, lazy, and short-sighted. Trevelyan, who was in charge of all the money in the UK, is quoted, There is scarcely a woman of the peasant class in the west of Ireland whose culinary art exceeds that of boiling of a potato. I like this quote for the following reasons. First off, it's an Englishman critiquing the culinary skills of some other group of people, which is just hilarious. Second off, he straight up says, peasant class. Nowadays you'd get like a dog whistle, but he just straight up says, yeah, they're peasants. They don't own the land or get a say in how it's used, but it's their fault for the famine. Oh well. And third, it's basically the 1849 anti-Catholic slash racist version of Any female born after 1993 can't cook. All they know is McDonald's, charge they phone, twerk, be bisexual, eat hot chip, and lie. Now let's look at some examples outside of Ireland. We're going to look at food production from 1979 to 1993 in a few countries. These numbers are per person food production. So South Korea's food output during this time period declined 1.7% and there was not a single famine. Japan's food output per person declined by 12.2%, and there also wasn't a single famine. Botswana's food production, a country in sub-Saharan Africa, plagued with poverty. Their per-person food production fell by 33.5%. That's more than a third, and there wasn't a famine. But king of them all, Singapore, saw a 58% fall in food output per person but there was not a single famine. The reason for this is that incomes in those countries were rising across the board, and not disproportionately enough to trigger a famine. Don't get me wrong, they were disproportionate rises, but never enough that one group became so wealthy as to threaten the ability of another with large-scale food denial on the scale of a famine through the market. Just like a fall in incomes can cause famine, a rise in the income can as well. Incomes in a country are always relative, Imagine everyone but a single tribe becomes incredibly wealthy. Suddenly, that tribe is now poorer, and if food production doesn't increase, then the price of food will go up, and they'll be threatened with starvation. Remember, the freedom to acquire food that you need to survive depends on your ability to sell what you can produce and the ability to buy the food that you need, if you can call that freedom, I, I guess. Famines occur when the relative distribution of wealth is amplified, either because one group gets poorer or one group gets wealthier. Because of this, economic downturns and economic upturns are cause for concern when considering famines. The same goes for natural disasters. A flood in Bangladesh in 1974 wiped out the employment of millions of people, and the result was a massive famine, despite the food supply not being affected. Now, don't get me wrong, the level of food output can affect the price of food or the wealth of households, but it's the price that drives famine, not the food. Take the United States. 40% of the food grown in the US is never even eaten. It's planted, watered, fertilized, harvested, shipped, sold, and then thrown right in the garbage. 40%! One might think, wow, we have so much food that we have all of this extra. Well, 
15% of US households are food insecure, meaning that they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. The number of children going to bed hungry each night doesn't paint much of a prettier picture either. Not everyone in the US is fed. Remember, the market isn't distributing food based on need. It's distributing based on money. It's a market. And the money you have isn't determined by what you need to survive. This problem of wasted food and hungry people will only get worse as incomes become less equal, the rich get richer, which remember is the same as everyone else getting poorer, and social welfare programs which act as safety nets get cut. For example, during the economic downturn that followed the COVID pandemic, grocery store theft is on the rise. Hunger in America is at the highest level that it has been for decades. We are even seeing an increase in grocery store shoplifting as desperate Americans try to keep their families from going hungry. All of this taking place in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And the most commonly shoplifted food item? Baby formula. At the beginning of the COVID pandemic, millions of tons of food were just piled up in mountains going to waste because there was no one able to buy it. It's not like there were any less mouths to feed. We as humans always have to alter nature to suit our needs. And if you think that markets and their equilibriums are natural, then there is all the more reason to think that we can and should intervene in them to get the outcomes that we desire. Revelation is perhaps the most metal book in the Bible. It tells the story of the end of this world and the creation of the next. Dozens of horrible calamities befall the earth, from the sky unfurling to reveal heaven itself, to the stars falling from the firmament and landing on the ground. Jesus becomes God Emperor for a thousand year reign on earth and slays the beast with a sword he pulls from his mouth. It's all really fucking metal. The start of the end of the world is when the Lamb of Judea breaks the seven seals. The breaking of the first four unleash four people known as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Each rides a different colored horse and wields a different weapon, symbolizing what they embody. The third horseman is my absolute favorite. He rides a black horse, and he's the only one who appears to talk, although this is never confirmed. His weapon? A set of balance scales. He speaks. A shunix of wheat for a denarius, and three shunixes of barley for a denarius. A shunix is a Greek measurement of volume equal to about two pints, and a denarius is a unit of currency equal to about a day's wages. These prices of wheat and the less nutritious barley that he quotes are around 10 times their normal prices for the time. And the scales that he wields to weigh grain, they were only used in times of famine. And that is who this third horseman is. He's famine. Famine declares new prices for food, which are well out of reach for the common man. The horseman continues, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The price of luxury goods is to remain unchanged. Famine does not take food from the earth. The embodiment of famine from 2000 years ago was a spike in food prices and systematic denial. So the idea of famines that I'm outlining in this video is not new. I'm also taking it from Amartya Sen, the guy that I'm citing multiple times in this video. As we've gone over, famines in market-based economies take the form of relative poverty, either relative to other people in society or relative to the price of food, or both. But delegating the distribution of food to the untouched market is not the only method that's been used. Some of you may have had the idea of removing the market altogether to avoid famines altogether, altogether. All together. Well, the nice thing about market-based economies, and a market distribution of food, or any good for that matter, is that if all goes well, we can fix famines just by manipulating money. The market, by its nature, will sort the rest out, because it allots by money. And money is much easier to fiddle with than any sort of physical good. We could do a tax and spend program, or maybe just like print money, I don't know. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of default. There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created which those benefits are employed to purchase? But say you don't like markets at all. Reasonable. They're no panacea. That 
means cure all for any of you economists out there. And there are many cases where they are just a terrible method of resource distribution. Take medicine and healthcare, for instance. Ever wonder what the single payer in single payer healthcare means? Well, say you've got the market for some type of healthcare or medicine. Maybe it's the market for a prescription drug, maybe some medical device, whatever. Now say that there is a monopoly in this market. This means that there is only one seller. This is often the case in medical markets, as patents grant legal monopolies for given periods of time. On top of that, most medical equipment is highly sophisticated to produce, requiring a lot of highly skilled people and machinery, so the number of firms able to produce it is going to be small anyway. When there's only one person selling something in a market, that's what a monopoly is, then the person doesn't have to sell where the supply and demand normally meet. They can charge more money for the same thing, since people have no other option but to buy from them. Now let's flip this around. Let's say that instead of there being a single seller, a monopoly, we instead make it illegal for anyone but the government to buy medical supplies. We make the government a monopsony, or single buyer. Just like how a single seller, a monopoly, can force a higher price than normal, a single buyer, a monopsony, can force a lower price than normal. In many countries, this is exactly the case for medical markets like prescription drugs and the like. The government acts as a single buyer, or single payer, for healthcare. There are actually two implementations of this scheme in the US, known as Medicare and Medicaid. Additionally, other countries, unlike the United States, have strict limits on the profit margins allowed for medical supplies. This keeps not only the costs low, since profit is by definition extra money not needed to provide a good or service, but this also makes government purchases less expensive as well. But what about research and development? How could medical companies be incentivized to create new drugs without the profit motive? This is a common thought and criticism. So profit is by definition the extra money after all costs of production are paid. Costs including things like research and development. So if we were to put a limit on profits, either the workers would make more, the company would put more into research and development, or the price would go down. In addition, much of the research in the US is funded by taxpayer dollars anyway, or funded indirectly by tax breaks, so it's not like the profit motive is what's driving research and development to begin with. So there's no reason that this scheme of single payerness can only be used for medical supplies. It can also be used for a lot of things, say, food. Welcome to Maoist China. If you never thought that you'd hear a tanky and a libertarian say the same thing, just mention how Mao was a pedophile. Ruled over by Mao and his cronies, the economic system under Mao will, to anyone learned in the ways of feudalism, seem quite familiar. In China, the state operated as a single buyer for all grain crops in the country, and handled grain distribution in order to keep prices low. The state, as the single buyer, set quotas for the grain that they were going to purchase. Farmers were able to keep or sell whatever was left over after they fulfilled the quotas. Often though, this was very, very little. The distribution of food was done via a food dole, but the farmers were notably exempt from this. The remainder was meant to replace the need for it. The quotas for any given harvest were set before the harvest for some reason. They were based on previous year's outputs, not the output of whatever the given harvest was. Now for a while, everything was hunky-dory. In the beginning, farms were collectivized. They were consolidated into farmer cooperatives. Think land lakes but a little bit different. They were about 150 households in size. Replacing the old system under the emperor with this one saw food output increase by around 4.5% each year. No surprises that local democratic socialism works. Seeing the success of these cooperatives, the state ordered further consolidation. This is where the problems began to arise. The local system of democratic socialism was pretty much eroded. You see, in China, if you were a farmer, you couldn't legally move to the city or some other farm unless mandated so by the state. This is where all you go, hmm, sounds like they were tied to the land which they didn't really own, nor did they own the products of their labor, hmm. This wasn't that big of a problem when the farm cooperatives were relatively small. Anyone trying to free ride, that is, get the benefits from everyone else doing the work while they did nothing themselves, were easily dealt with. 150 families is about the size of a small town after all. But once the cooperatives got bigger, things didn't work out so well especially since the cooperatives couldn't kick people out if they started free riding. Combine this with a year of poor growing conditions and food suddenly became scarcer than normal. Not surprisingly, the next three years were arguably the worst famine in history. The people who died as a result of this famine were the farmers who had to fill the quotas when the state came asking for them despite decreases in food output. 
and were systematically denied the grain dole. Now remember, the decrease in food by itself did not cause the famine. What caused the famine was that the state kept mandating higher and higher quotas, and the farmers just simply didn't have the grain to give them. So the state would take all of their grain, and the farmers, being exempt from the food dole, had no food left over. The food which was present in China could have fed the entire country and prevented the famine if only allocated differently. This doesn't even consider the ability of the state to import food to feed people. But none of this happened. Grain continued to flow away from the starving farmers in rural areas into the denizens of cities and out of the country as exports. All told, the number of people starved to death was probably close to 30 million people. All of them rural farmers who were denied food, none of them urban factory workers or party members who received the grain dole. Bureaucrats in the Communist Party were quick to lie about the true extent of the food shortages for fear of looking bad and ruining their future careers. Meritocracy in action. I'm sure anyone in a private company can relate to that mindset. Grain totals were often inflated. During the height of the famine, the state thought that it had 100 million more metric tons of grain than it really did. Not that Mao would have done anything different given this information. Each official below him also chose to do nothing, don't forget. Even the ones who were right next to the starving farmers, collecting the food themselves, and knew the true state of affairs. This famine wasn't the result of there not being enough food in the country. It was because, like all famines, millions of people were denied it. Sometimes natural causes or farm mismanagement result in less food being produced than is needed for everyone in the country to be 100% wealthy. This just happens. A famine isn't when everyone in a country are only 90% fed, though. It's when 5 or 10% are 0% fed. In situations where there really isn't enough food to go around, a famine can easily be prevented by sharing available food more equally. And it's not like there was a food production collapse globally. Again, Mao could have imported food instead of exporting some of the grain if he really felt worried about everyone going a bit hungry or any of the millions who were starving to death. Famines are when a group of people are prevented from owning a subsistence level of food, whether it's because of the market or because of some other distribution system. But interestingly, there seems to be a type of society which is immune to famine. As an example, the famines which plagued the Indian subcontinent for its entire existence suddenly stopped once it gained independence. So, what is to be done? I've been speaking with kind of the implicit assumption that states can always prevent a famine, but choose not to. But is this really the case? Is it always in a state's capacity to prevent a famine? Yes. And they won't have to go to the cut off your toes style collections agency, also known as a front for the American bank colonialists, also known as the IMF. Ignoring the fact that there is always enough food available in the real world, for now at least, climate change might have something to say about that, and that a government that issues its own currency can always print money to purchase available resources, it's still possible, even if we restrict ourselves to the traditional view of government budgets, where money is a limited resource for some reason and everything else isn't? Most famines threaten to kill less than 5% of the population of an entire country. But let's say we're looking at a country that has a particularly bad famine. 10% face starvation. Now, what percentage of income do these 10% control? They're going to be the poorest of the country. That's just how famines work. So let's say they control 3% of the income annually. Looking at the United States, the bottom 20% control percent of all the income. So yeah, reasonable assumption. Now, the state will typically not need to replace these people's entire incomes. Usually a famine occurs when income dips below survival, not when all of their income gets erased. But let's say some natural disaster or some scheme by investment banks to collapse the economy leaves everyone unemployed. Even this is a small, small amount of relative wealth to redistribute. Three people in the US control as much wealth as 50% of the population, for example. But let's consider this amount relative to annual budgets. We only need to redistribute 3% of the annual income for a normal year to completely avert the famine. Continuing with the US example, the total US federal government spending is 35% of annual GDP. The lowest that this total ever gets for any country around the world is 11% for the Democratic Republic, not even close, of Congo. 
So replacing this 3%, which by the way is an extreme example of a famine, is still well within the wheelhouse for just regular government budgets. So yes, states can always prevent famine. I see two main counter arguments that could be raised to this. First, you can't just give money to poor people. And the second, even if fiscally possible, it might not be politically possible because this redistribution would be unpopular. Addressing the first issue, that you can't just give money to poor people, despite the fact that just giving cash to poor people isn't necessarily the form that the government program will take, anyone who says that starving people would spend money on drugs or alcohol or lottery tickets has never truly been hungry in their life. We owe them, in their faulted opinion, no consideration. On the second topic, on it not being politically possible because it would be unpopular, I thought that being able to do things politically unpopular for the betterment of the people, whatever the fuck that means, was a hallmark of dictatorial rule. Why then do only democracies do things like this and prevent famines? Hmm. Poor democracies have done exactly this. India had either a massive crop failure or massive loss in purchasing power in the years 1968, 1973, 1979, and 1987. Now India, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, is not a rich country, but there was no famine in any of those years. The solution to famine is not markets or capitalism or anything like that. It's democracy. Okay, but here's an alternative hypothesis you might be thinking of. What if it's really development that determines famine likelihood? Democracies might just be more likely to be well-developed than dictatorships, so the correlation between democracy and famine would be spurious. Fake news. Fake, fake, disgusting. Poor Scott. So this might be what you're thinking of. Many democracies are quite wealthy and many dictatorships are quite poor. But there are a lot of democracies which border dictatorships and face the same natural disasters or economic problems as each other. Sometimes the democracy is hit even worse than the dictatorship. Take the 1980s. Botswana saw a drop in food production of 17%, and Zimbabwe saw a drop of 38%. At the same time, food dropped 11% in Sudan and Ethiopia. But Sudan and Ethiopia had massive, horrible famines. Botswana and Zimbabwe had none. Botswana and Zimbabwe can both be considered democracies with competitive multi-party elections. This is key. Voters can complain all they want, but if there's no alternative for voters, no credible threat, as a political scientist might say, of replacing the leader or the party in control, then nothing happens. It's not nature that determines famine. There are famines which befall countries with increases in food output and countries which saw massive decreases in food output and suffered nothing close to resembling a famine. It also isn't the economic system which determines whether there will or won't be a famine. There were famines in Maoist China and the Soviet Union, as well as the United Kingdom. It is the government, the state, which causes famines. More specifically, it is democracy in the state which chooses to stop or prevent them. All states have the means to prevent famine, but only democracies choose to do it. In the same way that a traditional corporation, which when you think about it is literally just the dictatorship and nothing even close to a democracy, will perform massive layoffs even when the company is turning a profit. It's about who the leaders in the government are responsible to. The basically feudal economy of Maoist China could have been reworked to prevent the famine. A simple reallotment of the food dole to include farmers or even importing food would have prevented tens of millions of deaths. The Great Famine in Ireland could have been solved by a stimulus check or a subsidy if the UK didn't want to bother moving actual food themselves. Democracy prevents famine, not because elections are somehow able to get the most qualified individuals to positions of power, either. Every hierarchy basically does this automatically. Very rarely do power hierarchies make mistakes. They may just not be serving your interests, thus making it appear as though they're filled with idiots. Democracy prevents famine because the people in those hierarchies can be replaced, i.e. they have their jobs and livelihoods threatened by a simple vote of the people. There's something else which enables democracy to prevent famines. Chairman Mao actually spoke of this in 1962 to a large group of people. Without democracy, you have no understanding of what is happening down below. The situation will be unclear. The top level organs of leadership will depend on one-sided and incorrect material to decide issues. It will be impossible to achieve unity of understanding and unity of action and impossible to achieve true centralism. 
What? Chairman Mao defending democracy and specifically pointing out the faults of his red fascism? Don't tell the tankies. Without a free flow of information, democracy won't work. The freedom of information is important because it makes the voters able to take the people in power and hold their feet to the fire, so to speak, to keep them accountable. They can't hide things from the voters. Just to be clear, the system works like this. There will always be people in power. In a democracy, they are beholden to the approval of the public. The public can only really credibly and effectively assert their control over those in power when there are alternatives to choose from, i.e. multiple parties with realistic chances of winning and only if the public are aware of what is happening, i.e. there is a free flow of information. If either of these things fails, the public cannot effectively hold those in power responsible, and so you're no better off than a dictatorship. This speaks to a somewhat uncomfortable truth for many people. I've tried to boil it down to a single phrase, although it might not fit in perfectly at first, but trust me. The rich will survive climate change. Now this is pretty obvious, but it implies something. Often you will hear from people that climate change is the greatest crisis. All other issues are secondary. Now, despite this being a position that only someone who isn't stalked each day walking home from work, abused each day by people hostile to their very existence, or someone who doesn't have to worry about whether their children will be able to eat tonight, it's just false. There is a solution to surviving climate change. The rich have it. It's to be wealthy. Just like every medical advancement is worthless to the uninsured, and food surpluses are worthless to those too poor to afford it, the rulers and shareholders in dictatorial developing nations already have clean drinking water and healthcare in good schooling, and they're never going to suffer from a famine or from climate change. It's the masses that need to worry. Famines do not affect the rich or ruling class. They never have. This truth that the rich will survive implies that the real single issue is ensuring that everyone survives. The real single issue is equality. The real single problem is a lack of democracy. Get your class reduction of shit out of here, said the angry commenter at the guy who just spelled out the daily plights of those who have a less safe draw from society's birth lottery.